Hi, everybody. Um, so this is the lecture for Friday, the 11th of November, class number 34. Uh, just to begin with a couple of announcements, remember that uh, homework number seven, which is the suspended growth portion of secondary treatment, uh, that assignment's available now on Blackboard, and uh, your submissions for that should be submitted to Blackboard before noon on Monday, November 14th. Uh, also on the 14th, uh, in class, at the beginning of class, we're going to have quiz number four. It's been a while since we had a quiz, and so uh, we'll do that at the beginning of class on Monday. Uh, obviously, we'll be back in person um, on Monday the 14th. Uh, today's lecture covers the uh, first part of attached growth, which is uh, another form of secondary treatment where instead of the microbes being uh, floating around in an aeration basin, we sprinkle water over a fixed film of microorganisms that are breaking down the BOD. So this comes from chapter 24 of the textbook, and we'll continue talking about this topic on Monday as well. Um, I am going to email you an example and the solution to the example so that you've got that handy as you work through this, uh, as you watch this lecture. If you've got any questions related to the material or the announcements or just anything at all, please uh, feel free to send me an email. Some place that the bacteria are growing. And let's just take a step back and think about what's the whole objective of wastewater treatment. Um, in wastewater treatment, we have some dissolved contaminant that we're trying to remove. Remember, primary treatment is pretty pretty easy. You know, the primary clarifier, you've got heavy things that sink to the bottom of the clarifier and uh, floatables like grease and oil and foam that goes to the top. And so we scoop the bottom, we scoop the top, and by doing that, remove some of the contaminants. But then what's tricky to remove is the dissolved BOD, the, the oxygen demand that if it gets into the river, it's going to cause um, a decrease in oxygen and harm to aquatic life. And so here in what we've been studying so far in suspended growth in an aeration basin, it's called suspended growth because the microorganisms that are doing the treatment are floating around. They're freely floating inside of the tank. You know, a limited number of them have the ability to move on their own. They have motility, but the majority of the bacteria are just, they go where we pump them. And so in return activated sludge, we're activating the aeration basin by pumping in the hungry um, biomass and it breaks down BOD even faster. So just to compare that suspended growth, which we've already been talking about, to fixed growth. In fixed growth, instead of having microbes floating around inside of a tank, then, and we can return the sludge by pumping it from the secondary clarifier. Just to compare that, in fixed growth, the microbes are living on the surface of a media. And so they're attached to rocks. Um, they still do the same thing, though. They're still consuming a substrate, which is the main thing we want them to do. We want them to break down oxygen demand. We want them to consume the pollutant. And of course, as they do that, they require oxygen. And let me dim the lights a bit so we can see this picture better. In fixed growth, instead of having the bacteria floating around inside of a tank, the bacteria are coating the surface of a media. They're on the surface of a rock. Sometimes we use synthetic media like plastic pellets. But water is being sprayed over a packed bed. And the water, as it trickles downward through this packed bed, the bacteria that live on the surface of the rocks are reaching out into the water and grabbing some food, essentially. That dissolved substrate, the BOD we want them to remove, um, they're getting it from the water that floats over the surface of the rock rather than those bugs being floating around inside of the aeration basin. So it's really important for us to consider what's happening underneath the surface, because we can't really see with our eyes where the magic happens in a trickling filter. Um, all we can see is there's a rotating arm that this wastewater is being sprayed over the media, usually rocks. So it's going around in circles, trying to distribute the liquid evenly over the surface. But under the, under the surface of the rock, the water is trickling uh, over the surface of these different media. And in the voids, sometimes there's water and sometimes there's air. And one of the really nice advantages of a trickling filter compared to activated sludge is that a large part of the energy requirements that 
we have to provide electricity for pumping oxygen or stirring it really vigorously to deliver oxygen in here. Um, we may not have to provide any additional oxygen in a trickling filter. Natural ventilation can be used instead of the uh, diffused air delivery in an activated sludge, sludge system. So when it works, it's really a great option, fixed growth, because of the reduced requirements for electricity. So here's a cross-sectional look of just a diagram showing us that at the surface, there's a rotating arm. And sometimes, depending on the, the flow rate that's being delivered, sometimes the rotation of the arm can be driven just by the jet coming out. You know, the water exiting one side of the arm is enough to propel that arm forward. You know, usually they'll put a motor on it just in case they need to continue spinning the rotating arm during low flow delivery. Um, but the, uh, the main idea is that the flow coming in has a high concentration of BOD and the flow coming out will have a lower concentration. Not, not extremely low, but lower. And so uh, it's essentially achieving the same objective, but using a different approach. So let's look at the full process from beginning to end. The raw sewage comes in, and it goes through the, uh, the rack or screening to try and move debris that would uh, damage pumps. The grit chamber is where the heavy particles like sand and broken glass settle down and uh, so a clear liquid leaves the grit chamber and enters the primary set settling tank. And in the primary clarifier, uh, whatever is not dissolved will hopefully settle to the bottom. The majority of what's not dissolved settles to the bottom is sent to uh, digest that sludge. Some of the, uh, the oils and grease are removed off the top. But secondary treatment is where uh, the magic happens. And it's, uh, it's this process in activated sludge, which is where we've spent the bulk of our time so far, where we were recirculating sludge. Uh, in this case, we've, we've replaced the aeration basin with the trickling filter. It's a way of delivering air and providing an environment for the uh, biomass to grow. Um, now, there is recirculation here but it's for a completely different reason than there was recirculation in an aeration basin for activated sludge. And so just to contrast activated sludge, all right, so in activated sludge secondary treatment, we have the inflow coming from primary treatment and it's going to the aeration basin. Okay, so in the aeration basin, we're adding a lot of oxygen here. And the flow goes to a clarifier. And then there's overflow from the clarifier. So who can remind us why we were recirculating sludge in activated sludge. What's the purpose of that? All right, very good. So activated means we're taking the biomass that settled in the clarifier and down at the bottom of the clarifier that's not a great place to find something to eat for the for the microbes that are down there. They're in sort of a, a starved environment. So when we pump that sludge back into the aeration basin, they're in a really good place to start consuming substrate quickly. Now, of course, we have to waste some of the sludge, and that's what this line is. This is the waste sludge. If we didn't have a waste sludge, then the sludge would continue to accumulate inside of secondary treatment. But by introducing that activated sludge in the aeration basin, it consumes substrate much, much more quickly than it otherwise would. So how is that recirculation, where we're recirculating sludge, different from the recirculation here? Right. Yeah, you'll notice we're not recirculating the sludge. So who wants to speculate why that might be? Why are we recirculating the, uh, the effluent from the secondary clarifier instead of 
the digested, uh, instead of the, the sludge? Why recirculate clean water instead of sludge? If, if I asked you to speculate, you can take wild stabs in the dark on this one. That's a really good point. You know, sludge is thick. It has high concentration of solids. Over here, when we are taking the, uh, the biomass and recirculating it, there could be concentrations as high as 5,000 milligrams per liter. And so, remember, this is a, a filter media, and we don't want to be pouring sludge over the filter media. So that's definitely part of it. But that's not all of it. There are other, there are other aspects as well. Remember that uh, when we recirculate the sludge, what we're really circulating is the biomass. Where's the biomass here? Yeah, the biomass is on the surface of the rocks. It's like a scum layer that forms on the surface of the rocks. And so we don't have to recirculate the sludge to get biomass in the trickling filter. The, the biomass is naturally living in the trickling filter without us having to add it. And it's going to stay there because the water that comes through there is naturally separate from the biomass. Here in an aeration basin, when we suck water out of the aeration basin, we're sucking out the water and the biomass in equal measure. They're, they're all mixed in together. But here, the water and the biomass are naturally kept separate. So, you know, that's another, another point of it is that, you know, we don't recirculate this, the sludge because we don't have to, and it would be bad operationally. But then there's one, there's one last aspect of it, and that is that in a single pass, the trickling filter doesn't take out that much. It only takes out a little bit of BOD each time, and so we have to send it through many different round trips. It, you know, the, the water has to go through one time, then two times, then three times. It has to actually recirculate several times before it's removed enough of the mass that we can take a portion of that water out and, uh, and waste it finally to our receiving body. And so we'll talk about why is the trickling filter not so effective and why that forces us to recirculate it multiple times. But, you know, in a conceptual question where you're giving a short answer, just to give you an idea of exams, I may ask you to compare recirculation in activated sludge with recirculation in uh, trickling filter. And so explain the differences. Explain the difference in the purpose, the difference in operations. And, uh, and so that covers some of the things that we've been talking about. Any questions about this process overview? Okay. By the way, did you get a copy of the notes? Everybody else have the notes? Okay. So let's just look at the media. Um, like I mentioned before, sort of the, uh, the traditional, the old school way of having a trickling filter is it's just rocks like actual stones, and they're circular-ish. They're kind of irregular, but uh, usually 25 to 100 millimeters in diameter. Now, more recently, it's become common to use plastic media, and, like basically exchange the rock for plastic. And you can see this plastic media, they've drilled holes in it. And uh, I've got some media back in my office. After we take our quick break, I'll bring it in to show it to you. you. We can all pass it around. It's, some of it's been used, some of it hasn't been used, but it's, it's all safe, it's been cleaned. Nobody will get sick. But, um, so why do you suppose we've made the shift from like rocks to plastic pellets? Any ideas on why there would be an operational advantage to using plastic instead of rocks? Okay, yeah, it could be cheaper. Easy to remove the biomass. Okay, that's a good point, is you brought up the issue of we had to waste some of the sludge. I'm really glad you made that point. Okay, so over here, when we're talking in terms of activated sludge, we have to get rid of some of the biomass. Otherwise, it accumulates forever. That wouldn't be good. So over here, 
we also have to have some of the, uh, the solids are going to be removed. And the coating that's on the surface of the, uh, the rocks is going to slough off. And we'll, I'll, I have that word on a, on a future slide, sloughing is what it's called when the, uh, the biomass layer gets too thick and it just sort of just peels off, like the slime falls off of the rock. Now, uh, it is true that with a plastic media, you can have better control over how thick the biomass layer is. And so it's not necessarily that it's like it's easier for the biomass to slough off, but instead it gives us more control as a designer. And the thickness of the biomass layer sometimes has an effect on its performance. And so that's another good advantage of these plastic pellets is that we can be more picky and more targeted on how thick we want the biomass layer to be. Let me give you another hint about one of the advantages of plastic instead of using rocks. In the traditional case, those stones, about the, the highest you'd want a trickling filter to be is three meters because the stones are so heavy. And you have to have really uh, strong reinforced concrete walls to keep the, the filter media in place. But in the case of plastic, you don't have to have you know, reinforced concrete walls because the plastic is just so light. And so that allows you to make the filter taller. And remember that as the water trickles through the filter, that's how the, uh, the removal is occurring. The water is going to seep through the stone media and if it's only going three meters, we have to recirculate it more times. But the taller it is, in the case of plastic, we can go taller, then that just means that you're going to have more removal per round trip through the filter. So it's more efficient. And it's not always pellets. Um, sometimes it can be a mesh, like you see here. Just anything that gives you a high ratio of surface area to volume. Because what we want to provide, the environment we're creating for our biomass, is we want there to be a lot of contact with the biomass and, and the air. You know, we have to deliver essentially three things to the biomass. We have to give it some place to live, oxygen, and substrate. So oxygen, food, and just some place to be. And so the surface, uh, the plastic surface and how polished it is is going to control the thickness of the substrate of the biomass layer. And then um, if we have a continuous mesh like this, they can actually sometimes retrofit old rock filters with a uh, just plug and play solution of putting in a continuous mesh and get improved performance right off the bat. Um, sometimes just, you know, there's an infinite number of different permutations of reactors. Uh, they've experimented with hanging sheets of plastic as a location for the biomass to grow on. And so then at the top you can see there's a series of sprayers that spraying the, uh, the water down over the plastic sheets. And then the biomass grows on these sheets and then they slough downward and uh, the water goes out towards the clarifier. In the case of these plastic sheets, sometimes if the layers are so close together, there's just not enough natural air circulation. And so you can see here they're indicating an optional blower. That's just to ensure that there's enough oxygen delivery to the, um, to the biomass. So I wanted to show you a video of a trickling filter in Sweden. And it being in Sweden is kind of uh, actually impressive. It's a testament because sometimes people are critical of trickling filters worried that cold conditions are going to make them less effective because when the, when, the, uh, when the air gets cold, then the bacteria slow down in the rate that they utilize substrate. But as we know, Sweden is a Scandinavian country. It's very high in latitude, and it gets very cold in Sweden. And so if they can have a, an effective uh, trickling filter in Sweden, and they do, then we can certainly, in most parts in the United States, have trickling filters work OK for us just, you know, so long as we size them appropriately. Okay, so here are just a few key points to emphasize. The microbial film, or the biomass, it's growing on the surface of the media. Um, 
and with each time the water is uh, sprayed over the surface of the media, the microbes are only taking a small fraction of the waste. It's not like in the trickling filter you have 100% of the substrate at the top and zero at the bottom. In each uh, single cycle that the water goes through the, uh, the trickling filter, it may only remove a small fraction, but through uh, recirculation of the water, you can get a good overall removal. Uh, calling it a trickling filter is sometimes a bit of a misnomer because it's not physically filtering the contaminant. Uh, it's filter only in sort of a conceptual terms. You know, we sometimes think of filtration as screening. You know, um, contaminated water goes through a really porous, uh, a fine poured filter and it comes out clean. Well, that's not what's happening here because the, uh, the contaminant that we're removing isn't, uh, isn't suspended for one thing. It's a dissolved contaminant. And so it's not physical screening that's happening here. And even if it were, the pores or the, the size of the media voids is much too big. And so it's screening only in terms of um, we're pouring water through a media. Um, but as the, uh, the substrate is removed and the bacteria grow, then they're sloughing. And this is what I talked about earlier, how um, just when there's too much slime on the rock or on the plastic pellet, eventually it gets too thick, the gravity, uh, gravitational forces will pull it off of the, um, off of the surface and uh, then a, a new layer will grow. And it's this sloughed off slime layer that is what gets um, settled to the bottom of the clarifier. So we're doing the same thing. We're turning a soluble substrate, which in a million years you can't clarify a soluble substrate by gravity because it's dissolved. By definition, it's not going to settle under gravity. But by having the bacteria consume that dissolved contaminant, then uh, we can settle out the body mass of the bacteria that have grown because you know, that's a settleable solid. And that's removed in the secondary clarifier. Now, this isn't uh, a solution that's always going to be without difficulty. Um, if you have a high organic loading, meaning that you have a lot, a highly concentrated BOD and a small filter area, then you can have the slime growing so quickly and heavily that the pores can become clogged. And if, if the, uh, the size of the filter media is too small, that's another time that the, the pores can get clogged is if you don't have a correct spacing between the uh, filter media. Um, if you're going for natural circulation of oxygen, and it's very important that um, you design that in advance and not just assume that there's going to be natural convection of the oxygen. As sometimes even when you're planning on not having a blower, uh, you sometimes have to put one into place just as a backup to provide oxygen, um, especially in hot weather. Um, because in hot weather, in hot weather, oxygen is less soluble in water. But then the other extreme, in cold weather, the microbes are less active and they're, slow, they're more slowly removing the substrate. And so it's extremes in weather that sometimes cause troubles for trickling filters. All right, so let's get into the theory a little bit more of zoom in on the layer, uh, the slime layer and the filter packing and try and take a look at what's occurring. Uh, there are four things depicted in this slide, and what we're ultimately driving at is we want to understand the rate of substrate removal. And so here you can see I've got units of grams per day of removal of substrate per meter of surface area. And so this is a flux. We're talking about how much mass is getting in through a layer of stagnant liquid and to the biomass. Actually, the microbes would consume substrate more quickly, but what's our, our limiting factor, uh, looking at the kinetics of this, what limits how quickly you can remove the BOD is how quickly the water is able to pass the BOD through this stagnant liquid film. And if you have a very thick liquid film, that slows down the mass transfer even further. So this is sort of the actual depiction of what happens. You can see that there's an irregular thickness of the biomass. 
Now, even if you have a perfectly flat filter media, uh, the biomass grows more quickly in some sections than in others. And so you have sort of a jagged, irregular surface. And what that does is it changes the thickness of the liquid film. And it's diffusion of substrate through the liquid film that limits the rate of utilization. Man, hope he doesn't hit a patch of ice. All right, so this is an idealized representation of the same thing. So what's the difference between actual and ideal? We're going to uh, try and look at mass transfer, and we're assuming a constant thickness of the biomass, assuming a constant thickness of this stagnant liquid film. Stagnant means it's not flowing. This is the liquid film that's basically so close to the biomass layer that it's uh, experiencing the no-slip condition, that the frictional, um, the frictional resistance of flow, the biomass layer is is staying on the filter packing. And so the water that's flowing across the surface of the biomass right at this interface isn't flowing with any positive velocity. The, the bulk of the liquid flow, the further away we get from the biomass layer, the velocity increases. But right at the interface of the solid, then the shear stress that the solid is applying to the liquid, which is flowing downward, the shear stress is upward to resist the movement. And so that that's what causes this stagnant liquid film. And so how quickly the substrate passes through the liquid film is what limits the rate of utilization. And there's a brief video that shows the principles of diffusion. Just by dropping a dye of water, a, a dye into water at a couple of different temperatures. So diffusion is the process of a liquid mixing into another liquid just by molecular action and not by it being stirred. And if we put a spoon down into this and started stirring it and moving the spoon around, obviously it would mix much more quickly than it is right now. But what you can see is that it's very slowly spreading out through the liquid, the dye is. And so how quickly the dye spreads into the liquid is kind of a representation of how quickly the substrate is able to diffuse through the stagnant liquid film that's on the surface of the filter media. And so you can see that it's, it's not a quick process. And uh, here in a minute, I think they show the difference between cold water and warm water. And so look at the differences in temperature and how that affects diffusion. In the cold water, the liquid seems to be diffusing more slowly. And because of the temperature differences, it just sort of sinks to the bottom of the container. And so that's another reason why in cold weather, a trickling filter is a little less effective. Not only are the bacteria slower, you know, the kinetics of cellular respiration decreases at a low temperature, but then to make matters worse, the food is getting to the bacteria even more slowly in cold weather because diffusion is lower. We have a slower rate of diffusion when um, the temperature is low. So think about how quickly can the food make it through that liquid film. And that's what's be de being depicted here in this diagram. It's showing here S sub B is the concentration of substrate in the bulk liquid. And the bulk liquid is flowing down because we sprayed the wastewater at the top of the trickling filter and it's flowing down over a surface. In the stagnant layer, there's no movement and so the decrease in concentration is just because the bacteria that are inside of this layer of biomass, they're consuming the BOD that's here in solution and so there's a gradient of the bulk concentration of substrate and then S sub S is just the concentration at the outer layer of the uh, um, of the biomass. And sometimes what we do is we think about this S sub S uh, is 
similar to the concentration that's coming out of the clarifier, or that's coming out of the trickling filter. And so, actually, we're not able to apply this relationship to uh, design in the same way that we do with activated sludge. You know, when we were going through the kinetics information for activated sludge, that's actually what the design equations are based on, is it's, it's based on the real world uh, application of the rate of biomass growing. But in the case of trickling filter, we, we apply empirical equations that have been developed just because um, it's really hard to accurately model how the concentration decreases as you go downwards into the filter. In this simplification, it's sort of like a, a 2D model instead of a 3D model because we are not able to represent or sort of even think about how S sub B is lower at the bottom of some control volume than it is at the top of the control volume. So when I say empiricism here, that just means equations that have been developed based on observations of data rather than based on the application of these rates. All right. So for our in-class exercise, we're going to take a stab at working with this idea of calculating the rate of transfer of substrate through the stagnant film and to the surface of the biomass. All right. There we go. So what I'd like you to do on this, like usual, you can partner up, get with another student, and uh, the questions that I've asked you, I'm asking in an order that kind of implies what you need to do to be able to solve this problem. Um, I'm going to set the solution out so you can take a look at that to verify what you're doing as you go along. Feel free to look at it. That's not cheating in an in-class exercise like this. And uh, we'll probably take about uh, 15 minutes to go through this in-class exercise and then we'll talk through the solution. If you take a look at a drawing like this, and you think about if this is a cubic meter, what's the surface area in there? You know, you really have really a lot of surface area, and so that uh, in the in-class exercise, 149, um, 149 square meters per cubic meter of volume, that's, that's a typical value. And actually, that's for rock. That's not even for uh, synthetic plastic media. And the, the plastic media can have a, even a higher specific surface area than the rock media can. So 